Charlie, thank you so much for joining us today. It's my pleasure. Glad to be here. So what I really want to focus on today is, of course, the Saw franchise, because the latest installment just recently came out. And I want to go all the way back, if you can believe this, to 2003, when all of this stuff began. So <laughs> let's travel back to 2000, I guess, in four, as James and Lee sort of go out for the Saw feature film after their sort of short film was a pretty good success. Can you talk about some of those first conversations um, and, you know, with James and deciding really where the music was going to go and what it was going to say in the film? Right about the time that uh, that Saw, the, the first Saw was, was being worked on in 2003 or so, that was about a year or so after I had left Nine Inch Nails. I was back in Los Angeles and was just getting ready to get back in the driver's seat on some scoring gigs. So the timing was perfect and it was just sort of a, 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 a synergistic moment that I was, I had some scoring experience. So I wasn't strictly speaking, just a guy, a refugee from a band mm. that was looking to do scoring. I'd already done that for years. I, I wasn't the named composer on those TV series in the eighties, but I was the hands on the mouse. So I did have a lot of experience. I knew how the you know, how the sausage gets made, basically. And um, so when I, when I first went down and uh, met with James and Lee and saw this movie, I knew they had something pretty special on their hands because it was kind of unlike, I mean, we've seen a big resurgence in, in the horror genre in the past 10, 15 years. But when, uh, when the first Saw was, was coming on the scene, it was pretty different in its tone and of course, in the sonic footprint that they had established in their temp score. And so as we, you know, the, the one kind of uh, game plan that we came up with was that, and this was partly my doing, and they sort of agreed with me, was that the whole score should sound uh, murky and indistinct and, uh, you know, a little bit distant um, with lots of industrial influences and sort of not a conventional orchestral score by any means. Um, and then at the crucial moment at the very end of the film, when the uh, sort of ending reveal montage sequence starts up and the, the most legible piece of music in the score, which was the Hello Zep theme begins, mm -hmm. we wanted that to feel like the lights had been switched on almost. And that, that um, as if, for the whole movie, you've been watching a bunch of guys beating somebody up from the other side of a parking lot at night, and you can't really tell what's going on. It's it's violent and ugly, and you don't want to get too close. And then at that moment when the Hello Zep theme would begin, that's when that gang of dudes runs across the parking lot, and they're right in your face now. Yeah. And so it, we had that, and you know we discussed that together, um, and you know, before I began work on any of the music. So we kind of knew that we had this theory in place that there should be some thematic moments and some hypnotic moments earlier in the score and, and a lot of ambient murky weirdness. And then all of a sudden this bright, bold, strident thing that would hopefully be hypnotic and mm. melodic and memorable. And that's what the ending theme the hello Zep and i theme, think which... i think it also sort of became that thing where you were watching the film even if you're on five six seven and you hear the hammer dulcimer you're automatically like okay i should start listening up now like they're about to explain exactly. what the hell just happened you know what i mean it became yeah. kind of the trademark to like okay pay attention kids there's a lot of information about to come <laughs> yes. your way really quickly yeah. and a lot of quick edits and flashback cuts yes. with voiceover so because there was going to be so much information flying at you um the piece of music couldn't be uh, elaborate. It had to be something that you could, that the, the viewer could uh, decode quickly and wouldn't have to pay too much attention to for fear that it would divert, you know, it would use up too much of their CPU while they're trying to pay attention to mm -hmm. all this complex narration and these flashbacks and so forth. And so that really affected how I tackled what the musical content of that cue was and how sort of there there's really not a lot of musical material it's not you know a complex flowery arrangement by any means and so that meant that you could understand it quickly and then as it went on and gradually would build it wasn't like there was all these crazy key changes and elaborate harmony voicings and stuff that mm -hmm. would 
make you want to pay attention. It just it's kept getting bigger and brighter and higher and louder and everything. But it wasn't uh, complex in terms of the actual musical data yeah. that's in. And uh, so we had that game plan in place. And fortunately, it worked. <laughs> yeah. So one thing that makes the Saw film so incredibly different from a lot of other horror film is like the way that the films are cut together, especially mm -hmm. the first three and the way that a lot of the traps are sort of presented in the very, very sort of fast cutting manner. So, of course, for a composer, I would imagine some of the really hard aspects of your job is, of course, working with the cuts and everything. For those, especially the first three films, working with those trap sequences where the cuts are just boom, 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 boom. What's it like working to a cut? Like, how do you make decisions on where to put the downbeat and where to, I mean, where do you start with that? Well, you know, I've been lucky that all of the films have been edited by the same guy, Kevin Groiter, who also directed two of them. And mm -hmm. Kevin has a great rhythmic sense of editing when he's cutting picture. Um, and he kind of knows not to make too much of a mess of it that I'll have to, that, that will cause me trouble. But one thing that I did always do on those complex very rhythmic sequences is I would wind up spending, you know, a couple of days just listening to a click track against picture and building a very elaborate tempo and meter map. Um, sometimes I might program in just a very rough uh, industrial kick and snare pattern or, or something to give me a, a little more interesting sound than just a metronome click. Mm. But I wouldn't put in a whole bunch of audio until I had the tempo map exactly worked out. And I would just sit there and try to find a natural rhythm. I wouldn't use any, you know, calculator programs or I wouldn't measure the frames or anything. I would just try to find things that felt right. And then very, you know, just sitting there staring at the list, the tempo list window in logic, um, gradually, build the tempo map, obviously starting at the beginning of the queue and working my way towards the end and keeping in mind that in some cases I would want it to gradually get faster and faster and that here and there you'd have to insert, say, uh, I might have a, a, a spot where the, the rhythm would stop and there'd be sort of a, a gap and I might have to make that gap be like one bar of 5-8 of or something or 7-8 to, to, so that I could drop back in right on a downbeat that would be perfectly synced with a, a cut or with, you know, a blade falling or whatever. Um, so I would get pretty elaborate with building that tempo map. And uh, there was, a, there was one point when it wasn't on a saw film, it was actually on, uh, uh, I believe it was uh, death sentence. Another James oh, Wan, the, the Kevin Bacon movie, right? Uh huh. Yeah. Which is totally fun. Yeah. I love that. In that movie. When, when was that? What was that after the third one? That was 2006, right? Or something I like that? So. Yeah, I think it was yeah. after. I, th I think Dead Silence was first, then Death uh, Sentence. Okay, yeah. In sort of at the same time, we did a Saw movie every year mm. for that se initial seven years. Those were but busy we, three years then. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. And I was doing two television series at the same time. Oh, man. <laughs> were 22 episode long seasons and were hour long series that were just wallpapered with score. So I would do that all fall and winter and then cram in my two movies in the late spring and summer. But when I was doing Death Sentence, there was one moment where I'd been working on the, this elaborate tempo map. I think it was for the, the there's a chase and fight scene in a parking garage. Oh man, and yeah, I remember that. Gabe wanted to come over and, and see what I'd been working on. And he's like, oh, I wanna, and I've been telling him, well, I've got some great ideas for this scene. And James came over sort of a day before I was ready. Um, and he, he came in to hear, he's like, oh, can I hear what you've got for the uh, parking garage scene? And I kind of, you know, my toes <laughs> curled up a little bit because all I had was the tempo map. <laughs> mm -hmm. And to me, the tempo, map, and it was very complex. There was like, there was f whole phrases of, of, of odd time signatures and, uh, you know, a lot of gaps. And then we'd come back in at a different tempo with a different time signature and so forth. So it was very complex, and I'd fiddled with it for like three days or something. But the only actual musical data that I had in there was just like some very rough programmed drums. So I had to, you know, be, fortunately I had w built up a, a good working relationship with James, so I wasn't 
uh, afraid to do this. But basically, I played him my click track, mm. and I sort of sang along to it. Ah. Saying, You're going to have to picture this, man. <laughs> I shouldn't be playing you this, but I will. And I played him the whole thing, and you could hear the, the program kick and snare and the metronome click, and you could hear these gaps. And I was, I was literally singing along to it, kind of going, okay, it's going to be like this. And because I had it in my head, yeah. I just hadn't recorded it yet. But I had worked out the framework, the tempo map and all the meter changes and everything. So I knew what it was going to be, but it wasn't that yet. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, James, you know, we, we had a laugh about that, but he did – under, he was able to understand my intention, and uh, so that was the most kind of daring uh, maneuver that I pulled on on all the movies that I did with him. But that just to circle around that just uh, illustrates that for me anyway, on a complex rhythmic cue, having the, that roadmap and that framework worked out as precisely as possible, I mean, to the frame, means that then the, that's, the, that's the only part of it that's work. Once you have that framework in place, the rest is fun. And it's, you know, now you have the black lines outlining everything, and now you just have to color in the mm. different. And so whenever I have a complex rhythmic cue, uh, I, I do not rush myself uh, and try to hurry up and write some music before I've worked out the tempos and the meter changes. I get all that framework as elaborately and precisely drawn up, and then I can begin coloring in all the spaces. And that's so far that approach has seemed to work really well over the years. Yeah, well, wow, that's an excellent answer. So I'd like to talk a little bit about um, John Kramer, the ca main character in all the Saw films. I want to talk about him like sort of as a character and perhaps hear your approach to getting inside of his mind. I think that one of the things that make him so unique is the fact that he's a very multidimensional character. Because in a lot of horror films, we just get that slasher character who's just killing everybody for no reason. You know, and, you know, exactly. And I think as Tobin describes him, because he did a whole lot of interviews for the promotions of this film, he describes him as an architect and a trained mechanical engineer. He loves to read. He has many philosophical ideas, but obviously he carries out his ideas in a massively sadistic way. Um, <laughs> but how, how did you approach this character and what was the journey like through the, all the films um, with him? Well, I wanted to, you know, whenever Tobin's on screen and you know, he has this very measured way of moving and speaking. He's never in a rush. He's never frantic. Everybody else is losing their minds and running around and getting mm -hmm. frantic and breaking a sweat. And he never does. Um, and so that led me to create, there was a few themes that, that starting with Saw 2 is where, I mean, obviously in Saw 1, there wasn't, you know, he's lying on the floor for the entire movie. Yeah. But starting with Saw 2, we, had, there were, we began to see a lot of uh, longer scenes where he's in his lab working on his traps and on his machinery, um, and in some cases talking to some to some victim who's you know tied up in a chair or whatever. And he always had this this great sort of I mean it's very terrifying the way he's mm -hmm. so slow and measured and utterly confident. He knows that he's not going to get caught and these people are not going to be able to like break their the ropes that hold them or whatever. So he's just this very measured delivery. And that led me to create a, there was a few pieces of music that I created in, in the, in saws two through four, maybe that went with his, what I call the lair scenes when we're in his lab or his evil lair. And they had a very hypnotic feel. There was, there was a couple, the first, one of those pieces I think was called Baptism, and it had this sort of piano arpeggio, just a very simple little pattern that was had just a high piano kind of plunking away at like 96 BPM and had a little backwards component. There was a backwards version of that riff, and it was a, much like the Hello Zep theme. The musical data that was encompassed in there was fairly small. You know, if, if it goes around for two bars, you've, you've You've glommed onto it and you can you've mm -hmm. taken it in. And then as the cue would go on, uh, the root note would transpose while the little arpeggio pattern would stay the same and other elements would come in. But it wasn't 
again, it wasn't some like the Hello Zep theme. It wasn't something that uh, was going to be introducing all these radical new sections that you had to to that, the, that might distract the viewer when they should be paying attention to what Tobin's character is is doing. Mm. And so I had a few of those themes that that accumulated over the the next few sequels from two onward. And that was very much a reaction to his measured delivery. I mean, I, I needed to have some sense of motion and tension. It, those cues, I didn't think that they should just be sort of pads and squishy, floaty sounds. I wanted there to be some sense of urgency because, you know, occasionally the camera would swing over to show somebody, you know, strapped into a chair, trembling or whatever. So there was a sense of, I, I wanted there to be a sense of urgency and, uh, you know, you could feel your pulse pounding in your, in, mm. in your temples. And that's what led me to use a, a, a sort of semi-rapid little arpeggio, but then to have a drifting, floating feel to it that mm -hmm. that sort of mirrored Tobin's very slow action as he would, you know, gradually place the shotgun in the in the mount that was going to yeah. be aimed at one's head or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So again, I very much react to uh, what's what I'm seeing on the screen in those cases where I want it to feel like the, the music as, as though the characters are sort of dancing to the music and the, mm -hmm. that they're in sync and that the speed with which things are happening and the, the, the pace that the actors are de delivering their lines and their performance, I want to somehow mirror that or, or follow their lead. Um, and, that's been that that approach has, you know, I've used that quite a lot throughout the, the franchise. And that's worked pretty well because it helps to to add an, an an almost innocent quality to some of his scenes. And when when he's, you know, preparing the traps and just so slowly working in his lab. Mm -hmm. And I think that kind of helps make his care, make the audience maybe a little sympathetic to his character. Yeah. It's not just screeching terror noises when, when he's doing his no. thing. And, uh, now, the, the thing that I'm sort of curious about is at the, of course, at the end of the third film, we begin to realize it's either at the end of the third or the fourth, we begin to realize that Hoffman and Amanda have their sort of little own thing going on. And they're just randomly rampaging and killing people for literally no reason. And they aren't giving him a chance. Did you approach Tobin's philosophy on giving people a chance and the meaning of life and everything like that to their sort of murderous agenda? Or were you sort of part of that, that deceptive game that the, the, the film was trying to play on the audience to sort of make that surprise at the end of the movie. Well, I always, I, I didn't want to give away anything. I, you know, I never want the music to lead the plot mm -hmm. except in, you know, in, in some instances I may foreshadow something that's going to happen in act three with, by using the same chords secretly in act mm -hmm. two or something. But in, in a moment by moment basis, I, I didn't, I never want to really get in front of what's, what's occurring on the screen. But what I did do in a, in a few spots is, you know, there was, there's a sort of group of chords and melodic structures that I, that I become in my mind anyway, kind of the, the, the template for the saw music. And there's a few ways that I can voice some of those chords that even though it's almost, I mean, I'm literally just moving, you know, f f I'm moving one finger by a half step mm -hmm. and just reducing the sort of agony component <laughs> of, of a couple of the chords. And it, it, it injects a, 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 not a sympathetic, uh, air, but, um, a kind of less evil tone tonality to within the framework of a piece of music that might all be that might already kind of be um, a, you know pretty dark and scary and just so at certain points you know there were, almost every trap scene had a, a moment of realization or redemption or something like that and so I would try to leave myself the opportunity to just have I mean it would often be maybe it's so subtle that no one even notices but I did yeah 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 totally. <laughs> And, and I would just always keep that in mind that where is the spot in this 
this the horrific trap sequence where the character makes their decision or makes their choice and is there is that an appropriate moment to to you know move that one finger over by a half step and change the, the chord voicings there but in a larger scale in a larger sense i would also do that um you know because there was towards the ends of the movies before we get to the inevitable hello zep moment yeah there would usually be a couple of cues that were that i always thought of uh as fake out cues that it's almost like you think maybe this is where the hello zep theme is going to start and in some cases i would use in some of the movies there actually was like a fake out it, the dulcimer would start and you think it's hello zep and then the cue would change and it, it mm, wasn't yeah we're not there yet yeah you know? and but there were other cues you know for instance in jigsaw this latest movie there's two cues towards the end uh the shotgun cue and the laser collars cue that come before the hello, the final eventual hello Zep theme. And both of those are based on the same kind of musical DNA as hello Zep, but in a less kind of forceful and driving manner. And um, almost to the point where it's almost a reverse fake out in that no, the audience doesn't think mistakenly that this is the hello Zep moment. They, there, there's because it doesn't have like the dulcimer and it doesn't have the same sounds, yeah. but it's almost like they realize it maybe if they're paying attention and maybe if they're a musician, maybe halfway through those fake out cues, they it might start to sink in that oh wait a minute this is some of the same that little three note phrase mm -hmm. and are we there are we there yet you know yeah. and of course and it's revealed that no you're not there totally. but those. Moments are a way to uh, to hint at the uh, the redemption quality. Mm -hmm. And I, some of the and I think in the like the latest jigsaw like that it was a perfect example of how you guys return to that whole like amazing sort of like ending where it has that grand reveal because the whole entire movie especially towards the end you're thinking oh it's the detective of course it is no yeah I mean like you don't even have to think about it and then bam you realize that when the hammer dulcimers finally start for the last you know sequence there that's when it really makes its grand reveal and then you did your job right. Yep. Yeah. So I guess what was it like returning after seven years away from the Saw franchise with brand new directors, a brand new look? It has this very sort of glamorous look to it, very clean. Exactly. Yeah. To where, the, you know, movies one through seven were very rugged and they were very aggressive and they were very bitey. And this one had a very, um, I don't know how to say it, beautiful look to it. I think it's, you know, looks great. And it's precise. Yes. You know, the Spirigs, some of the, I don't know if you've seen some of the other movies that they've done, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, this, this one film they did called Predestination yeah. is fantastic, like time travel, multiple personality. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> a head trip of a movie and their visual style is definitely much more sort of precise and accurate and legible than some of the earlier Saw directors have had. And of course, you know, the earlier Saw movies in the in the first Brick of Seven, the, you know, it looked like it was, uh, it was very murky and dark and in some cases indistinct. And there was always this sense that something's lurking in the shadows. Mm -hmm. And with the Spearig's visual style, it was a, it was a much more uh, precise and crisp nature. And with the new, uh, with, with some of the new traps, especially like the laser collars thing, there was like this, this high tech element uh, that, you know, all the previous seven were all about like rusty metal, you know, and there was a little bit less of that in Jigsaw and, a, and kind of, you know, and in another sense, there was a lot of the storyline in Jigsaw that took place in daylight. You know, it wasn't all nighttime in some shitty little dungeon somewhere. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of like real world or outside world or daylight type of scenes. And so that definitely affected there was kind of two major uh, changes to, to my approach for this one. One is that in those sort of daylight or outside world or normal world kind of scenes, I took less of the rusty metal and underwater murky ambient approach 
and more the type of approach that I might take on uh, an espionage thriller or something with some some elements of synthesizer pulsing and some less insanely dissonant chords and just a little bit more of a daylight kind of sound. Um, and of course, the big chase sequence at the very beginning when Edgar is chased up onto the roof, that was sort of very unlike most of the uh, action scenes in previous Saw movies. Mm -hmm. That was like outdoor war drum kind of feel. Um, so that, you know, that af approach was a new way to, a, a new flavor to inject into the Saw franchise. But that kind of only went with the scenes when we're in the outside world. In terms of the traps and all the familiar Saw scenery, because the Spearig's style was sort of crisper and more precise, that led me to uh, to use sounds that were maybe a little brighter and pointier and sharper, um, and a lot of actual synthesizer sounds uh, and sort of big distorted uh, synths. I mean, even though my background is as a synthesizer guy, mm. quote unquote, I don't use lots of synthesizers on Saw movies. In fact, most of the Saw films have almost there's just there isn't any synthesizer. It's all weird wow. metal sounds and guitars and industrial drums, but no actual like bubble, 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 you know, no actual synths. Mm -hmm. um, but in this case, for Jigsaw, in a lot of the traps, I did use a lot of those type of sounds just to lean a little bit towards the world of the laser collar and to, to have a little bit more yeah. brightness and precision and, and force in some of those trap scenes. Now, where did the idea come from? And like in the intro of every single film, and I believe in Jigsaw, but I'm, I don't completely remember. You guys have the boat symbol at the beginning of every single movie. Um, and every soundtrack, even if you get Probably. the, if you get like the complete editions, you start every single one out with the boat symbol. how did you make that decision to, uh, to kick off every movie with that? Well, that, you know, I have this whole folder upon folder full of bowed metal sounds that I made. Some are, you know, some are literally squeaking rusty door hinges. Some of them are actual bowed symbol or bowed metal type sounds, but a lot of them are, are more sound effect type of things that just happen to have a, a natural pitch to them. So I've always had, and, and right from the first Saw movie, I, I wanted to use a lot of those kind of tones because to me that sounded like the movie looked, you know, it was all rusty and squeaky and crusty. Um, and so there is this huge palette of sounds that I have, which are, you know, for use only in a Saw movie. And it's not, it's, it, it isn't exactly the same sound each time around, but I have so many of them and there are two or three that, that are like the trademark saw thing, saw sounds. And I, I save those to use when, you know, for instance, the camera pans around and we see the red X painted on a door or something. And that indicates an important plot point. Mm -hmm. And that's when I'll use one of the two or three sounds that are, sort of saw signals, you know, it's like the bat signal that, that kind of goes with a, a visual moment that signals to the audience, hey, this is an important plot point. Um, and then I try to, you know, I save those two or three sounds for, for important uses only. And then there's, you know, a few hundred other ones that I can use as general ambient Merc generators. Um, yeah. And, you know, I just, uh, it had been a while, but I just went and saw Jigsaw in the theater uh, just two days ago. Mm. And I realized that um, there was a sound in, you know, I did this kind of adaptation of Hello Zep in the very kind of opening logos uh, under the production company logos and stuff. Yeah, yeah, I remember that, yeah. And it was just a short little thing. And that was very much inspired by a piece of music that, you know, uh, the Spirit Brothers, I, be I believe it's Peter, is actually quite a uh, accomplished musician and he had given me a piece of a few pieces of music that he had done on his music setup where he's like you know this is I hate to play you these but you know this might be a way that we could adapt some of the of the hello zap material into a kind of a different rhythmic feel and a more mm -hmm. like pulsing urgent feel and uh, so that intro piece of music, 
in Jigsaw is very much based on this demo that that they sent me. Um, hmm. And and that was just kind of a nod to, you know, we wanted to start this movie with something a little bit more uh, energetic. It wasn't uh, many of the previous movies title sequences have been just like these weird bowed metal sounds screeching. Yeah in sync with all the logos coming at you, but very kind of indistinct and non-musical. Yeah. And so for this time, we wanted to have it be something that felt urgent and pulsing and energetic just to set it up before we jump right into the big chase scene with Edgar at the beginning. Because that bone metal stuff went so well with that Lionsgate logo, where you see all the gears <laughs> shifting around. Works perfect. So before we conclude today, I know everybody in the composer community is super, super curious about what stuff you use. So I just want to do a quick Desert Island um, for the different orchestral stuff and stuff like that. So let's start well, out with strings, Desert Island strings. Um, probably Spitfire or, um, you know, I do use a lot of Spitfire sounds, um, but there's a couple of other ones. Um, the, the fairly recent release uh, from, I believe his name is Alex Wilbank. Uh, the, I, I had in a library... Uh, a while ago, which I used a bit and loved, called um, uh, what was it called? Cinematic, Cinematic, cinematic Strings. C oh, Cinematic and Strings. Yeah. He came out recently with a library, um, I believe, called Cinematic Studio Strings, which is yep. kind of a smaller ensemble in a smaller room, and that has that I love because it's kind of a tighter, a tighter sound. It's not quite so lush and squishy. Um, I also love uh, the old standby uh, LASS, you know, uh, mm -hmm. is that LA Studio Strings? Is that what that's called? Yeah, yeah. And that, because it's, a lot of people maybe don't like it because it's recorded so dry, but I love the way that the, the staccatos and spiccatos sound because they're very sharp and pointy and you can do very fast phrases without it getting blurry and messy. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, a bit of Spitfire, the new Bernard Herman, all of their Evo Grid series, uh, the new orchestral swarm, um, as well as I love that Spitfire goes off on weird tangents, especially mm -hmm. with the Evo Grid stuff, which is just very inspirational. You just sort of play a chord and wait for something to happen, and it's it's always there's many happy accidents to be had in there. Absolutely. All right. What about woodwinds? Um, I really don't use a lot. Of <laughs> I, I, I know. But, but if you just have one, if you, if somebody asked you to write a period drama, pretty score, like a desk plot score, what would you go to for woodwinds? I would have to go with, uh, Vienna stuff because I love the way their legato transitions. They really seem, I mean, they kind of invented that sort mm -hmm. of sampled legato transition technology, I think. And some of their woodwinds, although you do need to kind of treat them to, to, cause they, in many cases, they're fairly dry sounding, just the naturalness of how they play when you're a novice like myself uh, is astonishing. And it takes very little work to get the performance right. Maybe a little more work to get the sound right with plugins and reverbs and everything. But I do love the Vienna stuff for, for woodwinds. Mm, brass. Uh, for brass, um, I'm liking uh, um, Cinebrass, mm. which is from our friends... Who are our guys here that make Cinebrass? Cine samples? Cine samples, yes. There's a few. There was one patch they gave away for free at one point that was like monster low brass. It just yeah. had that ballsy kind of chimbasso, you know, <laughs> and, uh, So I've gotten all the Cinebrass stuff. The Spitfire stuff doesn't seem to have as much just brute force. The punch, yeah. Yeah, and so the Cinebrass stuff, that's that's been my favorite, and and I still have some libraries going way, way back to uh, from Project Sam wow. when they had like orchestral solo brass series and like way, I mean, 15 years ago or something. And some of those, although they're fairly dry and the instruments are crude by today's standards in terms of the mic positions and mm. legato transitions, some of the raw tones and some of the instrument selections that they have, you know, going all the way back to the early Project Sam stuff. Um, I do use a few of those to kind of augment and camouflage the, the cine sample stuff. What about percussion, traditional, and sort of your epic taiko drum percussion? Man, I'm a glutton for that stuff, and I've got it all. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, 
I actually, you know, most of the drums that you hear like on a, on a, on a saw score is just, they're all drums I recorded myself. Mm. Um, and I, I am a glutton for, for any epic percussion because there's one kind of category of sounds that, um, that I don't, that is not easy for me to create. And that's the sort of ultra distant and indistinct Tycho's as heard on, say, District 9. Remember that movie, District yeah, 9? Yeah, the Neil Blomkamp Which, movie, yeah. One of my favorite movies of all time, and I thought an amazing score by, if I'm not, I think it was Clinton Shorter did the score, I think, I hope. Clinton I'm getting that Shorter. right. Yeah, Clinton. Um, but there was this sort of very indistinct, not gentle, but distant-sounding Tycho's in that score that I always loved, and... That's one category of sounds that uh, that is not easy for me to record. You know, most of the drums that I use, I record. I have a great big concrete living room that's like 30 feet high. And I, have a, I was originally a drummer back in you know high school. So mm. I've always maintained a collection of drums. I have a ton of drums and percussion instruments. And the the it does kind of bother the wife sometimes. But uh, <laughs> I have a great sounding living room to, to <laughs> So most of the drums that I use, I just record my own performances and single hit samples. But in terms of those, the the missing links, um, believe it or not, there's an old library, which I'm not even sure is even sold anymore, called To Psycho. That was hmm. like the word Tycho with an S, like Psycho, Tycho's. <laughs> and that one, as well as, believe it or not, Drums of War from Cinesamples. Um, and some of the Cineperk series from Cine Samples, those libraries had a lot of that uh, District 9 kind of distant thunder sound. I do love the Spitfire Hans Zimmer percussion series. Um, mm. Those have some serious bottom end to them. And so for that sub subsonic element, I haven't found anything that matches the Spitfire Hans Zimmer stuff. But yeah. it, for me, it's always a grab bag of trying to combine a few different things and possibly layer them together for normal drums. If I ever just need a, like an actual drum kit with hi hats and stuff, I've been extremely surprised at the uh, instruments that come with Native Instruments Complete, like the '70s, '80s, '90s drummer yeah. and mock drummer and all those. Partly because the, for instance, the hi hats are sort of pre-EQ'd and they're quiet enough relative to the other drums that it's sort of ready to go right away. Mm -hmm. I do have all the other big uh, drum sampler uh, plugins like BFD and, and the tune track stuff. And um, you know, for instance, with, uh, with BFD, a lot of times the hi-hat, you load up a kit and the hi-hat is a thousand DB too loud and it's not EQ'd to be, it's sort of, it's a full, full level rendition of the hi-hat. And I've been very pleasantly surprised that the, the, the quality and the amount of like round robins and velocity zones in the factory native instruments, complete stuff. I don't use them that often, but they're, whenever I just need a quick four bars of, you know, Nirvana sounding drums, I've been pleasantly mm. surprised at how well those, those read in the mix. What about the drums for like the ending of hello Zep, like the final sort of, you remember what that, you used for that? There's a couple of elements there. One of them is, um, this distorted chunk of program drums that was like an an outtake. It was something that never got used. It was a piece of Nine Inch Nails. Like, you know, when we were doing the Nine Inch Nails Fragile album, we all had, we were all in New Orleans in this huge studio that Trent had set up. And we each had our rigs set up in different rooms. And Trent would upload to a, a file server, um, you know, and this is 20 years ago, a song that was that he'd started or an idea for a song. And then we would all do overdubs and contribute stuff and put it back on the server. And he would pick through it and pick little molecules of sound from what the rest of us had done. Um, and there was this crazy chunk of program drums that I ran through a bunch of distortion pedals and it never got used on anything. <clears throat> and in fact, the track that it was intended to be an overdub for never made it on the album. Mm -hmm. So I just had this scrap laying around. And when I was, doing the original version of Hello Zepp and I needed just some incredible frenzy to occur at the end. I had this chunk of audio. It was literally, I think it's 16 bars and that's it. 
And fortunately, I was able to use Ableton Live to manipulate the tempo and to take this ancient chunk of audio that by this point was, you know, 10 or 15 years old mm-hmm. and drop it over top of my track and and manipulate it. And that's the sort of ultra distorted layer that comes in. But the other layer that sounds almost like conventional rock drums with a sort of there's a kick and a snare and it's playing like a, you know, a, a snare on the one kind of beat. That is a fantastic sample library that I bought years and years and years ago. That is Joey Kramer from Aerosmith <laughs> put out a sample library, mostly of loops that are very kind of Aerosmith sounding rock loops. Mm. There's also single hits in there. Not a ton of velocity zones or round robins or anything, just enough single hits to make a basic kit. But the, t- I mean, I've always loved Aerosmith and Joey's sound and style just has a certain thing to it and he can definitely hit a drum hard so the main drums is joey kramer from aerosmith from his ancient sample library wow. with distorted outtake from nine inch nails over the top that's pretty extraordinary right there what about synth and choral stuff um for choir stuff i i i have a bunch but i still use the only thing i really use that's in my template is <laughs> I, I mean, it's, it's people are going to laugh, but it's the old Miroslav Vitus mm. choir because he had these crescendo diminuendo pads that were very gentle and they faded in slowly and then faded out and they they had a very ethereal, floaty quality to them. I don't generally use, you know, the, the sort of choirs uh, that you hear in like big epic scores, you know, singing nonsense Latin phrases. I have all of those. I have Voxos and all mm-hmm. the East West stuff. And I, you know, yeah. whenever there's a Black Friday sale, <laughs> yeah. I tend to buy way more libraries than I'll ever use. But I tend to basically just use the, um, you know, the old favorite Miroslav. Yeah. And is that is that the one that you use at the beginning of Hello Zep, especially like in the later movies? I think you I have believe- this. You have this little choir thing at the beginning. There's, I have this thing. Ah, yeah. And it almost sounds like it could be a, a, a Prophet VS or something like that. It doesn't necessarily sound mm-hmm. like um, uh, a, a legitimate choir. It's sort of halfway between synth and choir. But one the one sound that I do use a lot in um, in Hello Zep is let me see if I can find it here. Ah. And that is the an ancient sample from the hip hop era. That's the Apache scream. That wow. it was like every <laughs> terrible sample CD from the '90s. You know, like Zero Gravity, Intense Dance Samples, Volume Seven. <laughs> it's, it's a classic sample that's been on a million hip hop records. But what I did with it is I time stretched the hell out of it because the the original sample is just this. It's about that long. And so I time stretched it by like a bazillion percent to kind of turn it into uh, an almost a pad type sound that can be played on the keyboard. It's normal pitch is probably somewhere around there. It sounds like that could be something straight out of dead, like dead silence too. Exactly. And yeah, I I had to manipulate it quite a bit in a, in an audio editor to, to remove the pitch sweeping that's in the original sample and to time stretch it and then loop it and turn it into something that has a stable pitch that you can play a legible chord on. Mm -hmm. But it's got a terrifying texture to it. And that's, that's tucked into a lot of, a a lot of my scores just to add that sense of, of terrifying scream in the distance, you know? Yeah. Um, And uh, yeah. So what was the, Oh, and since, yeah, (laughs) well, we have a few, Wow. Um, we have the uh, there's an MS20. Mm. There's the uh, TTSH 2600, course, which is yeah. the the reissue reverse engineered clone of the ARP 2600. Um, this MS20 is actually the recently released MS20 kit. I have my original one that I bought for 200 bucks in 1986. Wow. Um, but it's all rusty and crappy, and every knob goes. <laughs> So when they came out with the re with the reissue kit, I bought one and it's fantastic. It has it, 
it ha- it sucks in all the same ways that my original one sucks, but it's not broken. Mm. Um, same with the TTSH. I had had a I had had two different original ARP 2600s over the years, both of which were broken in different ways and in in not in good ways usually. Um, and they can be, you know, the originals can be quite expensive and or difficult to fix. So when the, it had been a few years since I sold my last original 2600. But so when the TTSH came out, I said, you know what? I better grab one. And it's fantastic. I love it. Um, I've got a lot of Euro rack stuff, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, this Dave Smith pro two, um, Oh, it's amazing. It's a great little synth. It's yeah. super pro. Um, it's so full featured and because of its CV and gate stuff, it's a great front end for the Euro rack stuff. So I can, you know, send MIDI into it and use its sequencer and then through the CV and gate drive a few extra modules, uh, on the Euro rack, which is fantastic. Um, also have, I'm really into any kind of weirdo stuff like, uh, Mm. folk, just the folk tech piece, um, you know, semi steampunk hand-built circuit bent weird <laughs> oh, wow uh, wow <laughs> play keypads that by con by completing a circuit on between any two pads the signal the actual audio signal flows through your body <laughs> and so you become a part of the circuit right um and this is just a weird drone scape generator it has a reverb and a delay and a filter and this oscillator bank and these two sequencers and it's just a truly unusual piece i love the folk tech stuff um i did recently get the re the reissue mini Moog. model d uh, yeah which is the same story i've had two or three no i think four over the years i've had four of the originals um all of which were broken in one way or another um and when the uh when this one came out i gave it a try and it is just it's so fantastic to play a mini Moog with a keyboard that feels yeah, <laughs> not like it's 40 years old. Um, <laughs> and it sounds identical to my ears, to the originals, and I'm just so glad they made that. As soon as they came out with it, I, I knew I had to jump on it before they stopped making them, which they did. I do still keep around uh, three old favorites from the Nine Inch Nails years. Um, a Waldorf Microwave uh, XTK, which is, this is one of two in the world that are gray which they actually made specifically for Nine Inch Nails for our performance on MTV uh, VMA Awards in 1999. Oh. Trent was like, I won't play. We can't have yellow keyboards on stage. <laughs> <laughs> See if they make a gray one. So they made us two gray ones. Uh, Oberheim Expander and Profit VS, both from the Nine Inch Nails era and both still loaded with uh, the sounds from, from mm. Downward Spiral and Fragile era. Wow. I st- also love the uh, Roland V synth. I have all three models. I have the v- the original V synth. This one I keep handy. This is a V synth XT, and I do have V synth GT, the the last keyboard they made. Just a strange and beautiful and weird sample manipulator, um, which is sadly not made anymore. But we love it. I did recently get a Linstrument, which is a great way. A great unusual way of of controlling sounds, you know. Wow. Pitch is left to right. Pressure is volume, and up and down wiggling can be, say, filter or mod wheel or whatever you want. So it's almost like a rolly, but a little bit more vague. It looks like just a little bit more. Yeah, it's, it's sort of like a, it's like a rolly, but each row, it's almost like a guitar where each row is a string. So this second row might be a fifth above. The bottom row. Mm. So, for instance, you know, and the lights can be programmed to show whatever scale or key you want to be in. Um, so you can do things that are non-linear yeah. in the way that you know you can you can make note jumps that would be difficult to make on a keyboard type layout. Um, you can do big pitch slides within a row, and then quickly finger down you know you can drop down three octaves by just going you know two inches or so 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 it's a because it's a guitar type layout it's just a different way of approaching that although the first weird controller i got uh which is too big to keep on my desk is uh the haken continuum oh Um, wow 
which I love and I break it out, but I have to like pull, put it on a stand and put it next to me because it's, I got the big one for some reason and it's giant <laughs> heavy, but truly unique and a great way to manipulate sound. And, you know, for instance, that Apache scream choir, just one sample mapped across the entire keyboard, but played from the Haken continuum is a, a wild it, it's a long night, you know. <laughs> and so, so what about software synth? Do you use any software synths, or? Oh yeah, um, you know, believe it or not, the uh, like like many, one of my recent favorites is the Yuhi stuff, Diva, Zebra, um, and I think their stuff really has a tonality that is satisfying, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not a B. I'm not trying to a B against the hardware sense or whatever. It's just, mm. you know, I have all the I have all the other stuff. I'm a I'm a software glutton, so I have all the Arturia stuff. Blah blah blah. But and I do like the Arturia CS80, even though it may or may not sound like a real CS80. I, I find it interesting and fun to play with. Yeah. I remember back in the day, you know, playing with CS80s in the eight in the 1980s and thinking this is just sounds like a home organ to me. Like I was, I, I never, I don't get the, like, you know, I'm sure it's, it's just Blade Runner retro love that mm -hmm. has caused like this, this fetishing, fetishizing of the CS80. Cause I remember playing them back in the day and just thinking, this is like a home organ. This it has yeah. got that octave sound. And I didn't, it never, I didn't give a damn about it back then. So I do have the Arturia CS80 and it's just interesting and fun. It may or may not sound like the real thing, but it's, it's, it's an unusual Compared to many other soft synths, it's kind of unusual. Yeah. I do use Arturia Moog Modular sometimes just because it's very quick for me to, to create pulsing patterns with it. Um, and it's nice to, you know, it may, again, it may or may not sound like a real Moog Modular. I do have a real Moog Modular from 1969, uh, a System 15, that's ancient and rusty and crappy and needs a ton of work. It still works, mm. but I don't even keep it here in the rooms upstairs in the storage room just because it's a pain in my butt. And, you know, I'm it, it's been 30 years that I've been moving a damn filter knob and hoping it's going to do something different today, you know? <laughs> yeah. I got the Minimoog D just because that's a... It's a simple and fun thing to use as a bass reinforcer occasionally, and that's all I use it for. But mm -hmm. I don't... Uh, I'm not the kind of guy that fetishizes over uh, vintage synths all that much. The expander and the VS are things that are unique and weird, and they do have an unusual sound that I haven't immediate, I haven't completely duplicated from, with a software synth. And sorry, Arturia, but their plugins don't sound anything like the real VS. Yeah. Or you know, they sound ish. Sounds VS ish. But I did because you can actually dump over MIDI SysX the patches from the real Prophet VS into the Arturia plugin, which is a miracle and amazing. I did that. And mm. they don't sound anything. The real thing, I hate to be that guy, but the real synth, the real hardware sounds alive and organic and real and amazing. The, the Arturia Prophet VS, you hit the key and it goes, and it's a static, yeah. non-moving sound. The real thing, maybe because it's struggling to not burst into flames every time. You know? <laughs> that, that'll be interesting, just, interesting if that happens, though. I mean, wow. I hope it doesn't, you, but... You should have your microphone on. Record that. I, and I, I hate to be that guy, but another software synth I get a ton of mileage out of, even in this day and age of Yuhi, Diva, and Zebra, and all these great software synths that we have, is Logic's ES2. <laughs> the poly synth the original, yeah. that comes for free with logic and i've been using that for so many years i mean it's, it's almost 20 years now we've had that and i know it inside and out and it's just a very kind of it's not going to set it's not a synth that's going to set the world on fire with its amazing retro oberheim tones or whatever but for what i need a lot of the time is a, a very tight and controlled where i can get very small variations in the accent patterns of an arpeggio and stuff. And I've just had great luck with ES2 and it's still, I still use it all the time, even though it costs $0 when you buy a copy of Logic. <laughs>